welcome you all to the fourth forgot about the recording part but we would like to take a moment to welcome you all to the fourth and final session of the 2024 international colloquium my name is karen gunalin i use she her pronouns and i am one of the director board member of um, the commission for global dimensions of student development this year we are proud to present a series of four webinars around the topic of social emotional well-being and exploration um, of international graduate student voices. This event is sponsored by ACPA's Commission for Global Dimensions of, Stu of Student Development and is dedicated to giving international students, international graduate students, a voice related to their experiences in the United States while completing their graduate studies and seeking professional and faculty appointments in higher education. We hope that their voices will provide administrators, staff, and faculty working in higher education with insights to ways in which they can best be supported throughout their academic journeys and career transitions. So now it's the land acknowledgement. So related to ACPA's mission of supporting and fostering learning through the generation and sharing of knowledge and ACPA's strategic imper imperative for racial justice and decolonization, our commission would like to acknowledge the indigenous land that each of us occupies today. Thus, we would like to invite everyone to acknowledge the ancestral homelands they are physically situated in today. We acknowledge the painful histories of genocide and forced removal from this territory, and we honor and respect that many, the many diverse Indi indigenous peoples still connected to this land on which we gather. Today, we acknowledge the practices of settler colonial colonialism within the United States and uplift native perspective into our ways of thinking. You can um, check out this website to identify the local native tribes that you are currently situated in. And then in addition to that, I will put in, um, in the chat box for you to introduce yourself. Hopefully this, okay. Let me try the copy and paste again. Okay, so you can share about yourself, where you're coming from, and the tribes that you're located in. I will pass it on to Tamayo, one of the director red board member. Thank you so much, Karen, and thanks to the folks who are engaging in our chat. Uh, my name is Taijo, pronounced he, they. Uh, I'm a directory board member at CGDSD. I currently work at Drew University, which is located in Madison, New Jersey. Today, I'm excited to share that our commission is actively recruiting new directory board members. Um, involvement in directorate provides you the opportunity for ongoing uh, engagement with colleagues that shares the same interest in international education and cross-cultural learning. Um, we have up to 11 opening positions, so please check them out. The application deadline is Monday, May 20th, which is around three weeks from now. Um, if you want to learn more about the applications, the info sessions that we host, and the other related information, it can be found on our link tree. I will share the link in the chat as well. Um, finally, I would like to also share that we are raising funds to support the convention travel, um, convention travel for international graduate students. We hope you could consider uh, for, to support our commission's fundraising campaign, help us reach our goal of a thousand dollars before the ACPA 2025 next year. Um, we will also have a link for that. I will post that in the chat. Please, if you know a graduate student who are interested in the travel fund, uh, ask them to also follow us on social media so they can apply next year. Now, please uh, welcome our faculty in residence. Thank you so much. My name is Marianne Bodine Al Sharif, and I'm an assistant professor of higher education in the Department of Human Studies um, and uh, Human Sciences here at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. I'm also currently serving as the faculty in residence for the Commission for Global Dimensions of Student Development. So before we begin, I'd like to take a moment also to give you the land acknowledgement for my institution. The University of Alabama at Birmingham sits on the unseceded ancestral homelands of the Muscogee Creek Nation and the Shawnee Tulsa or Shawnee people. 
We acknowledge the forced removal, genocide, and systems of oppression that have dispossessed indigenous peoples of their land, and that white supremacy and settler colonization led to the destruction of the original indigenous homelands and its people. We are our dedicated to continuously working to educate ourselves on indigenous histories and will do our part to honor and respect the diverse and beautiful indigenous peoples who are still connected to these lands today. Today, I have the honor of introducing our uh, colloquium session titled, Our Journey to Career in Higher Education. We have two presentations for this session. Our first presentation features a dual ethnography by Xiaoyun Sim, Assistant Director for Employer Engagement at University of Chicago Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering, and Yuan Zhao, uh, Director of Residential Living at Seoul Ross State University Alpine Campus. Our second presentation features the critical narratives of Dr. Bojan from University of Hartford and Dr. Kayon Morgan, also from the University of Hartford. We will hold questions till after both presentations have completed. And at this time, I'll turn it over to our first presenters. Okay, hello everyone, happy Friday. Let me get my screen going. Don't forget to put in the chat who you are. We'd we'll love to get to know you all as well. Um, and so thank you to the Commission for Global Dimensions Student Development for having us. We're super excited. And just real quick, we will be talking about, because um, I like our title as well, so I'm just going to say it. Um, title is, what are you looking for in a candidate? The, candidate? the career search process for international students in higher education, student affairs. And once again, my name is Yuan Jo. My English pronouns are she, her, and hers. And currently, I'm at um, Seoul Ross State University. Hi, um, everyone. My name is Xiaoyun Sim. She, her pronouns. I'm currently at the University of Chicago. And also, we want to take a little time to acknowledge the land that we gather, inhabit, work, and live. Um, I am located in Chicago, Illinois, the original homelands and traditional territory of the Kickapoo, Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, and Sioux people. For me, um, from Alpine, Texas, the land on which I gather, inhabit, work, and live is original homelands and traditional territory of the Comanche, Apache, and the Jumanos people. These lands were the home of these native nations prior to their forced removal, re relocation, and continue to be embedded with the rich histories and struggles for survival of each nation. So we do encourage you to, you know, take take time um, in your day to look up, you know, the tribal um, nations in your area. Okay, we'll just jump right in. Um, we wanted to take a little time to share a little bit about our framework and methodology of our uh, chapter specifically. Um, we picked the Schlossberg's transition theory because it explains an individual's ability to cope with a transition, which are influenced by the four S's of situation, self, support, and strategies. And in our narratives of international uh, students' job search process, I also want to acknowledge that when me and Yuan were writing about the chapter, our narratives, we were reflecting back about our time as an international students going through the job search process. So you will hear us um, using the term we, us interchangeably throughout this presentation because we still in some ways reflect back to the time that we were a former international student. So coming back to our narratives in observing and kind of talking throughout our job search process, the four Essays that were just previously mentioned, uh, situation support, self, and strategies were observed as we engage in the different transitions. So um, later on in the presentation, we will talk a little bit about how we transition from post-graduation to navigating the job search process, negotiating the job offers, and kind of managing our personal expectations and the in the process, and as well as us stepping into our full-time career. Yes, and just a little bit about our um, methodology too, we were intentional in choosing the dual ethnography um, and the consensual qualitative coding because we want to make sure that this is, as we were doing research on like, okay, which way, which angle do you want to go into, this is the best um, way to capture our nar narratives as it allows for an engaged dialogue and critique on the social phenomenon, which is the job search process, which we, um, that are shared by the two of us, and we did all of this um, process together as well. Okay, jumping into our jobless journey, focusing on the career readiness during graduate school, 
Um, as you can see, like I'll talk about the first bullet points of like a checkbox of job skills, but there's an X on job navigation skills. So what do we mean by that? So through our uh, conversations together and how we uh, identified the uh, similarities of me and Yuan's uh, um, process of career readiness during graduate school is that we identified that we definitely developed jobs of uh, jobs search skills such as like you know leadership communication however when it actually came to like job navigation skills of the actuality of the job search process there were a lot of nuances that we did not know as an international application specifically seeking jobs in higher education student affairs so you know one might say that it's a similar job search process for an international students who want to work industry or work in corporate however i would say that there is actually a slight difference when it comes to applying for jobs in a um, higher education or university versus working in corporate and in my graduate program i was one of the handful international students in the program and when it came to career development or navigating what job search could look like, I would say that my program did not offer a lot of robust support. And they only, my program director just kind of referred me to speak to the career center at that point. And that was back in 2019, 2020, also during the height end of uh, the pandemic. And the career center and my program director did not really offer a lot of support. And I was at a large, in a public institution that only had one person who can at, who can support international students in terms of career development. And it was so hard to find a time to just schedule to speak to the career services professional and even just identifying what are the job opportunities looking like if I have a student affairs background and want to work in a university post-graduation. And I would say that like, you know, the questions that I ask myself, even though I have the job skills in terms of like being having an internship, having more experiences, but when it came to like navigating the job application process, I don't have any idea or where can I get started with. And just the simple question of like, how can I talk about the visa process in my job interview or how do I navigate the sponsorship question in the job application? was also things that I was clueless and don't know where to find answers about when I was in my graduate program getting ready for job search. And going off of that as well, I feel like um, we we think that the, the best description for the support that we receive are one size fits all. And they're mostly, you know, geared towards our domestic um, classmates, right? Just let's talk about that. And so the advices are pretty blanket statements. I feel, I believe that, you know, when I was going through my um, search process, it was around the 2016, 2018, so around that time um, as well that, you know, the, a lot of this um, feedback that I received are like, hey, let's just, you know, get excited about the job search. Let's do it. You know, if you it's OK, we don't like your first job. You don't have to be in it forever. You can change right after. If you don't like this job, you can like um, change it for the, you know, in, in the next semester, or in the next year. And I was like, oh, OK, that's right. That's right. But then once I started learning about the visa process and things like that, that we have to think about right on the back end, I'm like, hmm, it might not be that easy. I really need this first job to be hopefully something that I enjoy, right, that I would stick for it long term so I can prepare for that. It's a multi-layered visa conversation. And so we're not just planning for our first semester or our first year postgraduate. We're thinking about right that first three years or that five years, depending on what that um, visa timeline looks like. And um, that last bullet of needing to seek external support. Um, I was the only international student in my cohort and the one above me, there's only one. And the one above me, there's also only one. Um, and so I did not know that I can seek external support until I um, attended my first ACPN convention in 2017 for the first time. And there was a session that talks about career navigation uh, for international students. And that was very specific. And I think from then I get to meet right other um, international students who are also in the field, who are also going to similar, you know, experiences that I'm like, oh, there are people out there beyond those in my classrooms and those in, you know, um, inside my institution bubbles that I can reach out to, um, to get a more robust support. Mm -hmm. And after kind of we talked about what was career readiness looking like in 
our graduate programs. You also then talked about like what was actually when we put into action the job search process for us. So you want to talk about that, you know, she experienced kind of like the, the vibe of like a one size fit all career search process or preparation. But in reality, that was not the case for us. That, like I mentioned earlier, there were a lot of nuances that goes into it. How do we actually prepare for the process? And as you can see, like the first bullet point, and I just noted down like additional research and information gathering. So a lot of times like we, um, I said we because I, I, I work in career services. We tell students that you need to research about the company that you are um, uh, applying a job for or preparing for interviews about, which that's the same case for international candidates as well. We, I and UN, we went through that process of researching um, the institutions that are hiring, uh, have higher international uh, professionals before. And oftentimes for us, that when we research those informations and policies from institutions, there are a lot of writings or language that talks about how they could recruit or hire international faculty members, but there wasn't a lot of talks about how they recruit and retain staff members on that sense for foreign born and international uh, professionals. So on our end, we had to do a lot of research and information gathering to just be able to find a job that is willing to hire and potentially down the road sponsor us. And for me, it was also through talking to former international uh, students who are currently working higher ed and have been on visa sponsorship, how did they navigate that process and what are the resources available that really supported me and my job search process. And uh, I remember vividly that like a lot of my uh, cohort mates who are domestics that they did not start the job search process until their graduating semester. But for me, I had to start the beginning of my second year of graduate program. So I had to really start early and then Talk, jumping ahead to the third bullet point of a little bit about like how do I manage my expectations because like I need to manage expectations of like I receive a great degree for my master's in this program and also the reality of like it's the pandemic how can I find a job can I do I just return to my home country and how does that translate back like what are my skills that translates back to my home country if I uh, want to stay in student services so really managing my expectation and the reality of potentially not getting interviews, not getting a job, um, as well as um, the visa sponsorship process. Just remembering as well, so I'll be touching a little bit about that, um, you know, that first and second bullet points of the, um, I don't know if y'all look, you know, folks who have job search before looking at the job description, have you heard of this clause or clauses similar to these three that I'm about to read off? At the bottom, tends to be at the bottom of the whole website of the page, it would say things like, this institution will not sponsor employment authorization for this position, or this, this position is not eligible for sponsorship or authorization to work in the US is a precondition of employment and applications for this position will not be sponsored for a works visa. What does these mean? No clue, right? When I was job searching, as of till now too, I still don't know because I think my style is I will try until I get a no. And that's the that's the interesting, um, unique part about international students job searching is that there's no one way to do it right, right? I've talked to different people, some of my um, people that I have connected with at convention, right? They're like, oh, if I see that on the job description, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't even waste my time applying, right? Like I have capacity and things I also need to protect. My style at time was I'm just gonna do it all and see what comes out about it, right? Um, and so I only um, stopped pursuing a position when they, I think well, there's, well, there was only one case where they said that I have to pay them back um, for the inter for the on-campus interview fees if they were to offer me the position and I decline. And I asked them, right, hey, are you gonna, do you provide sponsorship in a nice way, of course? And they said no. So then I'm like, oh, the risk of me going, getting the job, having to decline it, not because I don't want the job, is because they're not gonna sponsor me, right? Then I'm like, mm, that's kind of outweigh the, the financial piece of it. So I end up declining that one. Um, but I think it's just the piece of the navigating that difficult topic of sponsorship during interviews as well. There's so many different strategies. Even I have different strategies. Um, I've job searched twice now and the 
the strategy I use the first time and the second time is different. And so um, let's just say, you know, this from the graduate students lens, my 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 um, my style is that I wait until my on campus to bring that up. Right. And I have folks I know folks who are like, I'm not going to bring that up until I get an offer letter. And so there's just a lot of things as we're thinking about we're in the job search process. Just like everyone else, we're trying to prepare for our interviews, doing our best, doing our research, but there's also these additional research that we have to think about. Plus the thought of what is it if we don't get any of this, what are we losing, right? We're losing not just the ability to stay in the US, but also all of the thing that we have built for ourselves, right? Our social capital, like everything that we have, if we need to leave this country, those are something too that we always constantly are being reminded of, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think like to add on to like kind of the final point of like managing expectations as well, like you want to mention like some of the statements that you see in the job description, like towards the end. I would say that like during both of our job search process, probably the first time, those uh, sentences or statements weren't that frequently available. I meant that by like back in the pre-COVID days, maybe like that line or that statement is not always apparent in a job description but when me and you and went through our second job search so I'm right now at University of Chicago my previous when I was writing this uh, chapter it, I was recounting when I was first going into the job search uh, process as a first year graduate uh, as a second year graduation uh, graduate student but right now when I was going through my second job search to work at University of Chicago when I went through the job search process there were more statements out there that indicated that this position is not eligible for sponsorship. So kind of noting the differences of like, I guess higher like higher ed is making it more transparent in terms of hiring of like right up saying that they don't sponsor so that they would deter people from applying. Okay. So then next one we're gonna talk about is the job search formula. And that's why y'all might be interested in coming here, right? What's the job search formula, Yuan Xiaoyun, for career placement and on the job? So let's see if any of this sounds familiar to you all. Feel free to react in the chat. <laughs> Having work or relevant experiences, such as, you know, your uh, graduate assistantship, internship, you know, all of that experiences, right? Important. First thing to tell you in grad school. Plus, right, networking, making good impressions, super important plus a good fit for the institution. This fit thing always comes up when we're starting to do interviews. Um, so this seems, right, people could agree, probably. Um, a fake nod is okay too. Of, you know, these are the three things that they tend to write prep um, students in, the, in graduate programs. But funny thing is, still no job. <laughs> or no job, uh, you know, getting a job without security. And so we're just, you know, wanted to bring in humor into this too. You know, this is a stressful process. And we just want to say that there's a disclaimer of, we've been preaching about there's no one size fit all advice. There's also no one size fit all in job search process. Um, and so as you hear us talk about our experiences too, we also wanted to remind everyone that there is more to this. There's more to the international students experience. We're also not one size fit all as well. And so there are different priorities and needs for each individual. So we do encourage you to, you know, at, um, aside from listening to our stories to also right um learn about other folks as well because there are um you know we are you know southeast asian women and our um our experiences would be different from right international students who are from africa or people with family or um, international students who are mothers things like that and so there's just a variety of us out there too so we just wanted to put that disclaimer And I also want to be mindful of time that we do, I do see some questions in the chat box that we can address after the second presenter goes through that. But jumping back to the slide about unpacking the journey, we also made it a point that we wanted to reflect about our, our whole process of securing a job. What are the things that goes into there? And both me and Yuan, when we were uh, conducting the interviews and like asking each other questions about that, we realized that you know how higher education or institutions talk about inclusivity, DEI, or how we need to um, have representation and all those things. But kind of thinking back that like there are not a lot of, at that point where we were reflecting, like there were not a lot of student affairs professionals who were international. 
And when we as international students wanted to like look for support and services, oftentimes the staff members are not prepared or well educated to support us or understand the nuances. So, you know, the irony of what we preach of like how staff that doesn't really represent the student body that we have at institutions. And oftentimes a lot of job postings that are out there that are recruiting people that doesn't actually have us um, that we as international candidates apply that does not actually lead to job placement as well as how with the great, great resignation of um, higher education, a lot of staff members are leaving. So how can we uh, uh, focus on like hiring international candidates and offer them visa sponsorship that in some ways that we can be better retain employees to um, stay in the field? Oh, my apology, sorry. Um, and then the next one also was thinking about, right, the, this American dream that, you know, we also may be chasing, right? Um, but just thinking of, I think where I wanted to point out is that higher education institutions can be the place to make the American dream happen, right? Like our parents have sacrifices for us to be here, thinking that, you know, getting the ed education in the US and all of that. Um, and we said higher education institutions because it's uh, considered nonprofit, so we are not under the H-1B cap exempt, meaning that, right, they, we don't have to go through lottery system, uh, for those of you who, who may have um, more information, more understanding about that piece. Um, but so it could have been like a good job security, right? Like, of hey, if the institution wants me, and I want them, we're good, because I'm not under the lottery that I might need to be under the hand of the government to say, I will, will I get this visa or not. But we're still having, you know, we're still facing all of these barriers and this lack of um, both salary and visa sponsorship transparency and this and this awkward dance sometimes that we're doing during interviews with our employers trying to figure out what is it, you know, are you, will you be able to provide me that sponsorship? Hmm. And also wanted to encourage folks to like really focus on like the strengths that we bring to the table. Like we understand that like maybe your non-negotiable is a visa sponsorship when you apply for a job, but really focusing and honing on like, can you network with the hiring manager beforehand? Or like, can you network with someone in the department beforehand to kind of get the, a sense of the sponsorship willingness before applying for a job? And like, when you're interviewing, really focus on like what you bring to the table rather than like focusing on what, on the deficit model of like, I need visa sponsorship. Focus on like the experiences, the skills that we talked about earlier of like that you bring to the table. And then while navigating the visa sponsorship conversation throughout the interview with the um, hiring manager and really for, and also the importance of finding your own community. Like you had mentioned, like she went to ACPA and found a community. And for me as well too, I was a first year graduate student attending ACPA and that was, when I first knew that there were other international students who are working in the field and have been have been sponsored, that gave me hope and what and an encouragement to want to find a job and stay in the field. And wanted to end the presentation to talk a little bit about our implications and conclusions of the importance of incorporating international grant narratives and career readiness programs in HISA curriculum. Um, as more and more um, international students are coming to the US to study, the importance of having international staff members working in student affairs, as well as like preparing for our domestic peers who might be interested in working in student services outside of the United States, how can we bring in those narratives as well? And furthermore, also advocating for inclusive hiring practices that ensures international and foreign-born professionals, including staff members, are not only welcome, but actively sought after in academic institutions, because this, again, um, showcases and promotes a more equitable representation of voices within the higher ed field. Negative sentiments directed towards international students, right? Most like economic research found a contrasting result and know that the impact of Im immigrants is small, especially over a long period of time. And so they claim that immigrants do not harm Americans' wages and job opportunities because the economy can adjust itself by increasing the labor demand to meet the influx of immigrants. And so this persisting misconception that international students who remain will take away jobs from U.S. citizens, especially in our higher education field, too. Um, sorry, this is a misconception in every field. But if you think about the value of our field of being 
um, right? We promote diversity um, and inclusion, things like that. And we want our staff, going back to that, we want our staff to represent our students. And so how are these two contradicting each other as well? Um, and lastly, you know, we also think that Right, we can raise our voices, um, but we also think that you know those around us can also help with that too. So regardless of what position you hold, you can also be an advocate by simply asking questions. And we're going to share with you all a little bit of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And so these, um, you know, if you're as a candidate, right, um, you can ask, "What are some resources I can maximize during my time as a student for?" career development support, where that's asking to your advisors or to you write people you meet at conferences or even us. Um, and, you know, as a colleague and classmate, those sitting, going through the same job search process, right? Like, ask yourself, like, how can I advocate on behalf of my international peers? Is it once you feel like, oh, all of this, you know, you're seeing an international students might be uh, having difficulty kind of figuring out what their job process is, or, you know, they have questions that they don't know where they can ask who they can ask, right? And so thinking about that for yourself too. Um, I don't know, Shar, you wanna end with our last one? Yeah, so and lastly, but as a hiring manager or you being in a hiring committee, how can you familiarize yourself with the sponsorship process at different, your, your own institutions? And a lot of institutions have policies about hiring and um, sponsoring international faculty members, but not staff members. So maybe better understanding uh, that process is as, and asking your, um, international affairs office people or just who on your who on your campus would have that knowledge to be able to share and I also want to acknowledge like there are a lot of comments in the chat box about resources uh, our commission I said our CGDSD has a great uh, uh, representation of international folks working in higher education that would serve as a great resource and um, Dr. Bryce who shared about like the uh, USCIS website is also a great resource and knowing that if you do a quick search, universities are going to show up that they do sponsor, but we need to acknowledge that a lot of them are going to be professor roles. So you want to ensure that when you're looking at information that if you're looking for a university that sponsors, take a look at the position titles that they sponsor. Are they all just faculty roles or do they include staff positions as well? With that being said, oh. Yes, yeah, so we're gonna wrap up our session. And so, um, you know, we have questions in the chat. We'll take a look at it. There are also Q and A questions afterwards as well. So we're gonna turn it back. Thank you, everyone. Thank you guys, that was great. And we're gonna go ahead and usher in our second presentation. So if you all wanna take the screen, it is all yours. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Bo, how about you go ahead and start us off? Thank you. Sure, no problem. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's our great pleasure to meet everyone here to present our study. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, we would like to do a brief introduction about who we are. Um, can we move to the next slides, please? Thank you. So my name is Bo Zan. Uh, I pronouns they, them, theirs, and I'm from Rhode Island, Rhode Island, USA, and I'm recently graduated from University of Hartford, and um, I'm currently a STAR Fellow at the STAR Scholars Network, and uh, also we have Dr. KKR Morgan, PhD, and who received, uh, who's uh, from Connecticut, Connecticut um, currently, and uh, is also Assistant Professor at the University of Hartford. Uh, next, we'll move in on some uh, uh, two acknowledge acknowledgments to uh, share with everyone, Dr. Morgan. Thank you, everyone. I know that we don't have much time and we want to facilitate your questions. So we just want to also do acknowledge the land on the ancestral homelands on which uh, we both sit. And I uh, also want to do a labor acknowledgement as well, because we want to respectfully acknowledge the history and forced labor of Black Americans. I'm connected based on my identity to my husband, who is an African American. And so it's also important to me to acknowledge the exploitation that has happened in this nation based on our identities. So our, um, I wanted to introduce our topic. Um, so this is our topic focus on the strangers in the north, critical narratives on the post-graduation career transitions of international doctoral students, uh, presented by both me, Bozen, and uh, Dr. K. R. Morgan from University of Harper. 
We'll go through the background. We'll talk about our methodology. We'll each tell tell you our story, and then we'll just kind of help us to understand what our story means in the context of this international student life. According to data in 2021, um, according to data in uh, 2021, the U.S. hosted 20% of the world's international students at all academic levels, among whom uh, many of them pursue doctoral degrees for their future employment or employment-based permanent residency uh, or uh, immigration to the U.S. And the reasons of many international students pursue their uh, employment in the U.S. based on the following reasons, first of all, the uh, their experience from top ranked companies and uh, decent salaries, English proficiency and uh, work experience in their resumes so they can um, uh, advance their career in their home country. And um, there are 59% of international students who were issued a, a EAD, which is Employment Authorization, authorization Document. Uh, in the year of 2019, among which 13% of those students were doctoral degrees of international students. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Um, international doctoral students experienced um, uh, different, uh, received the different uh, available support and resources uh, from policy and career related um, aspects. However, they experience challenges with career development and uh, especially during their uh, employment process, uh, which results in four major elements, including US immigration policy, uh, organizations and institutions hiring practices, career development and counseling services, and lastly, cultural responsiveness. And also based on our uh, review of literature, it found that uh, limited research focuses on the experiences of international students who are interested in seeking uh, employment after graduation uh, from the US campuses and um, also their factors influence the students transition during their career process. Go ahead, Bo. So who we are and the methodology, uh, first of all, myself, I am the, uh, the first uh, author of the um, study identified as a um, international students who, uh, who obtained a doctoral and uh, master's degree and, uh, and currently a, also a foreign employee in the US. Also uh, my current uh, and previous experience in academic research and profession uh, enables me to be able to um, equip me with the uh, knowledge, experience, skills, and ad advocacy to support uh, transitions and career trajectory of all the international students who have the interest to seek employment in the US. Thank you. For me, I was an international student when I came to the United States from Jamaica to pursue my master's. So I have here formerly an international master's and doctoral student. However, when I did my doctorate, I had a green, I was a green card holder, so my status was different, but I still encountered uh, some of the challenges as mentioned in, in Bo's former uh, slide. At the time of writing this article, I want us to understand that some of my experiences occurred as many as 20 years ago. So this is a longstanding problem as, as we will see and hear today. As a reflective practitioner, in regards to this study, why Bo and I collaborated, we wanted to address this long-standing problem, but I've also understood and supported many international students through their academic journey, just understanding their positionality and the challenges they're facing having gone through it myself. So our, methodo our methodology is what we call a cross-sectional analysis of our personal narratives. And we use critical personal narratives to engage in this research. What we found important in this study is that we needed to elevate the voice of international students so that higher education institutions, policy uh, makers, and so on could hear firsthand experiences of what is happening to understand and make the necessary changes. So our narratives uh, involved us looking inward and outward, exploring our experiences, our thoughts, our feelings, recalling past events, as I've said, from 20 years ago and even more recent to make sense and understand the, the differences in culture, relationships, 
and the context. And what we were able to do is to understand at a deep level the oppressive and repressive uh, encounters that we had and understanding power and privilege and how that manifested in our experiences and how to shift that dynamic as we continue our journey. So uh, I'd like to share my story so that uh, will help um, everyone to understand our uh, lens for this uh, story, uh, for this uh, background. So first of all, uh, pursuing a doctoral degree wasn't my plan. Uh, however, like many peers in a doctoral program, uh, I later decided to further my uh, education to enhance my research and leadership skills for future and career advancement in education. Um, and along the way, I faced the challenges at International Students in Four Aspects, which I listed here. Uh, first of all, always thinking about U.S. immigration policy. And second is hiring organization did not see it and they looked for it. And the third is I would have prepared better if I had the support. Lastly, is I grew as I trained each day. So first of all, always thinking about U.S. immigration policies. So the immigration policies significantly uh, impacted my um, academic career pursuits during the past few years. Uh, there were many times I had to consider my immigrant stat status and uh, re uh, related regulations before making any career-related decisions. Uh, my career goals had to be constantly shifted and adapted. Um, and then the questions remain the same. What are the immigration policies and visa options regarding international postgraduate students' employment if they seek to uh, pursue a career in the U.S.? And what legal documents should I prepare for the U.S. CIS? And what is the timeline for to follow before their visa or um, uh, status expires? And also, would a doctorate uh, make international students more competitive in the job market in the U.S. under uh, current uh, immigration policies? The U.S. immigration policies and regulations are complicated for me as an international student, and it took years to learn, understand, and prepare, and um, for me to find resources such as uh, the uh, attorneys and uh, the policy, immigration policy also remain the uh, the main uh, concern um, by the time. So it affects, it deeply affects my career decisions and transitions. Uh, so the second aspect is the hiring organizations did not see it, that they looked for it. So it took me some time to understand and um, to understand and familiar, familiarize myself with the job ap application and the interview process in the U.S., there were many jobs for which I met the criteria posted, but they were not given a chance. Um, uh, they, I was not given a chance to because for interview and also because of my status as I, uh, as an applicant who from a foreign country and the um, algorithm of the system seemed to have immediately em limited my application. I remember there was one time I submitted my application after three minutes. I received. Uh, uh, a, a email. I was uh, su surprised because I thought there was a response that was so sh so quick. But eventually, I found out there was a, a there was a decline. Email says you are not qualified. So I was uh, quite surprised as my first experience. Experience. So the human resources often um, learned my need for visa sponsorship, and then after extending the offer, and would immediately retract the offer because I was not a permanent residency or a uh, or resident or a citizen. And that organization was unable to sponsor me. So uh, my qualifications did not precede my legal status, uh, which was quite frustrating at the time. Uh, the third aspect is I would have prepared better if I had the support. Uh, honestly, because of the academic and cultural differences between the US and my home country, I was unaware of the um, career-related support um, and, and the services available on campus. So employers at college um, for their um, career fairs, usually they're looking for um, domestic students and international student services usually provide uh, services such relating to F1 student visa, OPT, and the CPT, but not deep, but not offer services related to non-immigration and immigration-based employment. So the career services of um, on another aspect, they offer help with the resume and cover letter writing and hiring information, but they were not responsible for visa and visa sponsorship related questions. So the role of my, uh, at the doctoral level uh, for the professional development, including uh, career review, um, career and uh, for career planning and um, peer reviewing and networking and promoting uh, students work in, and also in strengthening, strengthening these portfolios and ensure success, successful careers are essential as I gained my experience um, and I realized that collaboration between the International Student Services Office, Career Services Office, 
and the uh, academic department is key to help me to achieve this goal. And I wish I had known um, what careers uh, related support resources and options were available and that my university understood my career needs as an international student. And I would certainly differ in my career path um, preparation. I experienced less confusion and stress during that process. Um, so lastly, I, I wanted to say as I, as I grew, I trained uh, each day and um, it was a, a learning process as an international student seeking employment in the US. So my learning tethered between um, gaining awareness and shifting my acceptance so I could advance um, according to the requirements placed on me as an international student in the US. So I accepted that I, my career path was different from my US domestic peers, um, primarily primarily because my visa status and further resolved to learn the intricate, intricate uh, details. Um, realizing the limited resources and availability of career development and career counseling, uh, specific to international students at the doctoral level and the career differences uh, drenched in potential buyers. Um, I resolved to maintain my personal uh, collective identity. So um, like many other international students, I experienced tremendous stress um, for some time um, throughout my academic and professional life in the US, um, which has uh, significantly changed my career decision and pursuits. Overall, my experience in international students' career uh, planning, career development, and the career counseling grow. Um, however, the question re uh, remains, which um, did, inter did inter institutions also, also in the meantime grow in their knowledge to serve this population of students successfully? Um, uh, next, I would like to, you would hear Dr. Morgan share her story. Thank you, Bo. I'm a lot older than Bo, so my story will be shorter because my memory is short. <laughs> anyway, um, I just want to highlight a few key aspects that I, I believe are similar to a lot of international students and what they experience. How do I pay my bills? When I entered the United States, I had sponsorship from my home country. However, after the first semester, I lost that sponsorship. And so that was basically what my whole life re revolved around, trying to complete my master's degree and wondering how would I uh, pay for housing and how would I pay for my tuition? I wasn't even concerned about food at the time because I figured that I could survive off the house that I lived in with other international students that we would do community meals and I would get that. And then we had meals on campus occasionally or uh, invitation to international dinners. And so I figured food was taken care of, but my tuition and my housing were not. One of the things they don't tell you when you come to the States is that you can only work on campus and you can only work 20 hours on campus with the visa that you have. And that's very limiting. Very quickly, I realized that I would not be able to work enough money to pay for that. And so I started to just double up on how hard I work so that I could apply for every single scholarship possible to cover my tuition and housing. And then I was able to garner some uh, small amounts from friends and relatives across the globe kind of deal. But it was very challenging and it was a surprising reality that I wouldn't be able to uh, pay for my tuition and housing, but I made it. Career advancement misunderstood. One of the things I did not understand here was the job market. I did not understand how to apply for a job, did not understand the language. When I thought I was applying for a certain job in higher education, my resume didn't fit. My CV didn't fit. When I thought I was applying for a certain job in other organizations, it didn't fit. And so there was this huge uh, gap between my understanding. Uh, another challenge I realized was the ethnic and stereotypical bias based on my name. So my resume didn't make it through because of my first name. And so as soon as I started to understand, because I started to research and understand what was going on, I started to go by my middle name, which is hard to tell based on gender or ethnicity where I'm from. And I found that when I did that, I started to get uh, more calls. So those were some of the critical encounters in terms of my uh, challenges that I experienced in, with the career landmine. Then the other thing was, did you watch Cool Runnings? There was no cultural uh, humility, cultural responsiveness. When I came to the States, everyone thought that I had to have ha watched Cool Runnings. And that was always the first question. And when I said no, the conversation would end. 
So they didn't understand that a Jamaican, because I was told a Jamaican was so intelligent. And so I wrestled with that uh, identity that my qualifications, no matter how qualified I was, I was not seen as intelligent. So my qualifications did not precede me as, as, as Bo said as well. And I was just bewildered by these stereotypes that were advanced onto my identity. So then making sense of our critical narratives, we try to understand what was going on here. And as immigrants, uh, we grappled with these imposed identities and the identity politics and the boundaries of identity. And so we theorized our identity based on you know, our location and realized that we had so many intersections that institutions didn't understand, that hiring organizations didn't understand. And part of the goal, again, of this narrative is to elevate those intersections and give a clearer narrative of what international students are encountering and how to better support them. The other part that we uh, reflected on was who holds knowledge. And we realized that we were expected to know and understand and have information about information that we were not given. So immigration policies, there were all these hidden curriculum, all these hidden rules and so on that we didn't understand. Uh, financial aid, the same thing, not being able to get financial aid. So, and there was this knowledge that was held by a, a certain few that wasn't shared in ways that we could interpret or understand. And so we advocated for that knowledge needs to be shared. It needs to be a collective knowledge and that also our knowledge needs to be valued in the space and not just the knowledge of uh, the institutions or organizations or immigration and how they exist, but it needs to be a collective knowledge in order to dismantle the power and the hierarchy that exists um, in terms of international students and, and uh, their immigration status. So the significance of our, our uh, stories, um, <clears throat> we would like to, first of all, the um, our, the critical per personal narratives amplifies international doctoral students' voices and also foster identity and a connection uh, of students and the stakeholders. And these narratives also have the potential to inform uh, policy recommendations, also enhance the training for hiring uh, committees from organizations and uh, institutions also strengthening support from institutions. Um, also, it provides hope and aspiration to international students to guide themselves through the shared understanding and the knowledge in this um, perspective. Uh, also, it recognizes narratives as forms of knowledge and study. Um, they emphasize the importance of confronting these challenges and uh, also seeking for uh, those resources in cultural epistemologies and identities. Uh, lastly, they are authentic recognition of challenge challenges faced by uh, international students requires facilitating first person accounts to finally uh, address these areas to better support international students in the US. And that thank ends you. our and, presentation. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for listening. Um, please let us know if you have any questions. We would like to um, glad to share our um, experiences with you. Thank you all so much. So we're going to open the floor up to ask a few questions. We have about four minutes. Um, so we'll, we'll spend the next two minutes doing that and then we will wrap up. So maybe just one or two questions. So if anyone in the audience has a question, please feel free to turn on your microphone and ask that question. It looks like most of our chat box questions have been have been responded to. Have a request for links. Sorry, if there's no, I know that we're talking about like a lot of things that we're going through. I just want to say a word of encouragement. You're not going through this by yourself. You have people out here who are, you know, we're sharing you on. I don't know who you are, but it's hard. And I get it. You might not have people in your cohort, but as people are thinking about questions, but just want to let you all know they're good, they're good things too. This, you know, relationship and friendships that I, you know, receive going through this job process. And so just want to encourage people as well.
I'll put that out there. Thank you. I think I would also like to chime in really quickly. It's like the job, the landscape of the job market of higher ed has changed so much when I think probably when Payong was going through the job search process, me was going, I was going through the job search process, you and Bo as well, that it's so different right now that there were there are so many more resources and support available for international students who want to go into faculty role or, you know, work in the practitioner route or just in, you know, corporate and industry. So definitely like it looks the outlook is way better than when I was going through the process just a couple of years ago. I agree, definitely, for sure. There's a lot more resources. And even if it's not within your own institution, like my colleagues say, seek it out. You know, don't go through this alone. Uh, not all institutions have the same types of resources. And so we also have to consider that and give grace and kindness to the different organizations that exist. But do not do this alone. Even the group that is here now, uh, make note and see if, you know, you can touch base with other persons to see what resources are they tapping into and what's available and how can you have access to, to those resources. So um, one more information I'd like to share with everybody is that uh, please also feel free to check out my uh, dissertation uh, titled Ex uh, Exploring International Doctoral Students Experiences Seeking Employment uh, Using uh, in the U.S using uh, grounded theory. So uh, I think there are a lot of uh, information that might be helpful, but also I wanted to share that during my interview with uh, international doctoral students, the uh, challenges often exist to everybody and also your challenges might not be the same as others. So it is always important to seek out, you know, for help and also see the peers who might have the similar experiences with you so you can uh, find the direct support, but also realizing the importance of your academic uh, departments at the at graduate level. They are so important than the resources that you might need from international services and also the career services office. But also in the meantime, um, I think it's important to realize the uh, professional organizations how you know many resources and support they can offer. So don't afraid to always reach out to wh wherever the resources is. And also, lastly, I, I just want to share that um, uh, one. Uh, I think it's one third of my interviewees mentioned about mental stress, uh, and also you know including financially and also you know family and also physically. Many different issues. Also, when you're uh, international students, you are living and studying in a foreign land. You have various kinds of stress. So hopefully, I just wanted to uh, share that. Please feel free to talk to your family, talk to the uh, counseling services on campus to help you to release and live a healthy life and take care of your well-being. And uh, uh, there are stress, but eventually, you know, you everything will work out. And um, I hope this information helps too. Uh, glad to meet everyone. Thank you. All right. So guys, unfortunately, our time for today is coming to an end, um, but we would like to take a moment to thank our presentations um, uh, today, our presenters and our audience for giving us their time and commitment to this work. This session also concludes the 2024 International Colloquium, and we hope that the information shared in all of the sessions um, have provided you with insights to the graduate international student experience, as well as ideas on how you can better support graduate international students throughout their academic journeys as they transition into their careers. Thank you all so much for your time and for being with us. I'm going to share my screen, give you a little bit of information as you head out. Please um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you.